Okay. Um, I'm Ala Borisuk. I just want to briefly uh, welcome everybody to this um, talk series that are taking place of the SIAM Life Sciences 2020 meeting. This is our first talk in the series. Um, thank you everybody for joining. I'm hoping that you can also um, look at the schedule on the website and join us for the subsequent uh, plenary talks uh, that are all already scheduled, as well as the Early Career Prize and the business meeting. And there will be information coming up about mini symposia as the mini symposia organizers uh, set them up or put information online. So that should be appearing on the same website. So I hope you'll keep an eye at it and um, join some of those talks. Um, okay, so welcome to our first talk. The session chair is Karzamira Tsaniva Tanasova, and I'm giving control over to her. And she's in charge, and she will introduce our speaker um, and explain you to you how this all works. Thank you, Awa. So uh, welcome everyone to the first uh, plenary talk for this virtual edition of the SIAM Life Sciences 2020. Uh, before I introduce the speaker, I would like to remind uh, all the panelists to mute their uh, microphones, please. And um, uh, Sarah will be talking for about uh, 50 minutes, after which we will have some time for questions. I'd like to encourage the audience to type their questions in the chat and we'll read them at the end uh, to Sarah and, and she will have the opportunity to respond. So um, our first speaker is Sarah Sowa. Uh, she has a joint chair, a professor in the Department of Physics and Astronomy, uh, as well as physiology. And uh, her research uh, interests lie in the application of statistical mechanics to analyze complex systems such as the brain. And today's talk, uh, is on neural manifolds for stable control of movement. I'm very much looking for your talk, Sarah. Um, you're welcome to start. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much for the introduction. And again, thanks very much to both uh, Ala and Angela for the invitation. I was looking forward to being at the CM conference. And I guess this is second best to be able to reach you this way. Um, so the work I want to talk about today is in uh, collaboration with Lee Miller, who is a colleague of mine at Northwestern University. He's an experimentalist and, and we have collaborated for almost 15 years now and it has, um, it's been a lovely collaboration and I would advise any theorist who wants to work on how the brain works, wants to try to contribute to our understanding of how the brain works, to develop a really good collaboration with an experimentalist so that you know what you're talking about when you model the system. Um, the work was done in collaboration with Juan Gallego, uh, Matt Perry, and Rahit Chudhuri when they were all at Northwestern University. Juan is now an assistant professor at University College in London. Matt is a postdoc at Columbia University and Rahit is a postdoc at University. So they are all... Uh, gone through further pastures, greener pastures. So what I want to talk about is about the concept that when we try to understand how the brain works, we should not look at individual neurons, but should look at population activity, should look at the activity in ensembles of neurons. And moreover, I want to discuss a very important notion, which is the notion that the dynamical behavior of these populations does not span the full space of possible states of the neural uh, ensemble, but is actually confined to a subdimensional manifold. And uh, of course, that gives us a, a very good handle on how to attack the problem because it reduces the complexity of the script describing the neural activity and it allows us also to make predictions about what this neural activity implies in this particular example that I'm going to develop for you today in terms of the control of movement. And I'll, I'll walk you through the kind of math that we have used because I always, uh, as I always tell my students, let's start with a linear approach and see how far we can push it. And in this case, we were able to push it much farther than what we hoped at the beginning. And I'll, I'll tell you why in this case, the linear methods are, are unreasonably effective. Uh, so let's start with an example, which is just a simple motor task that I will use. That's the data that I will use to illustrate the ideas. 
So this is a motor task in which a subject or a monkey is supposed to reach us to eight targets. The eight targets are organized in a circle around a certain uh, a central target. So you either touch the screen or you use a manipulandum to move a cursor on the screen. You uh, are supposed to go to the center target and hold there. One of the eight surrounding targets is illuminated. So that's where you are going to go, but you have to wait until you get the go signal. Once you get the go signal, you actually move the cursor to the um, target that corresponds to that particular trial and if successful you get a reward. So this is this is the it, it's a very simple task it's called the center out reach task and it's um, it's an instructed delay in the sense that you have to wait for the go signal and the delay is variable from trial to trial. It's always of the order of half a second to a second but variable from trial to trial. So you really have to be attentive to the go signal if you want the trial to be successful. Otherwise, the trial gets aborted. So while the monkey is executing this task, we have implanted an electrode array in the motor cortex. I'll show you some details about that later. This electrode array allows us to record of the order of 80 to 100 neurons at a time. So each one of these rows corresponds to a cert to a specific neuron. And each one of the ticks that you see in each one of these rows corresponds to a spike emitted by one of these neurons. And we're able to record this data. In this case, I'm showing you about 20, 20 seconds of data as the monkey executes reaches to these uh, different targets. The A target is presented in random order and each trial corresponds to a specific target. So how do we organize the data corresponding to this? So we have a, a certain number of neurons. And so each row corresponds to a given neuron, neuron one, neuron two, neuron n, infinity. I'll explain to you in a minute what I mean by n infinity. And uh, we go from time one to time two to time capital T. We measure time in discrete bins. So we use bins of a given size delta that could be five milliseconds, 10 milliseconds, 20 milliseconds, depending on the experiment. So capital T is the duration of experiments in units of this bean size delta, and time is a discrete variable in this kind of experiment. So what do I mean by N infinity? So imagine that I could record all the neurons that participate in this task. In this case, if I could record all the neurons in the arm area of motor cortex, so if you're moving your right arm, that would be on your left primary motor cortex, which is kind of the way your earphones are, are going from the center to your left ear. And in that area, there is a map of your body and there is an area that corresponds to the arm. So if I would be able to record, um, if I were able to record from all the neurons that are modulated by this simple reach task, I would have to record from the order of a million neurons, 10 to the six neurons. So in the ideal case, if I was able to record all the neurons that participate in the task, then I would be recording of the order of a million neurons. And that's what we mean here by N infinity. We don't really mean an infinite number of neurons, but we mean all the neurons that are homodulated by this particular task. In reality, we cannot measure all these neurons, but we put an electrode array, as I explained to you, this is your brain. This is the frontal part of your brain. This is the back of your brain. Um, this is the primary motor cortex, as I said, going around your head this way. So you go to the contralateral. So if you're moving the right arm, you go to the left part of the primary motor cortex. And along this motor cortex, there is a homunculus, that is a map of your body. So we put this electrode array in the arm area of your primary motor cortex. The electrode array is about four millimeters by four millimeters, and it's a 10 by 10 array with 100 electrodes. So it allows us to record of the order of 100 neurons. And the separation between adjacent elect electrodes in this array is about 400 microns. Um, so now my data matrix is still has T columns, capital T columns, one so corresponding to each time bean in which I measure the number of spikes emitted by a given neuron in that time bean, but the dimensionality, the number of neurons that I have is much less. It's of the order of 100 for these multi-electrode arrays. There is a new technique for recording that is called neuropixels that allows us to measure from the order of 1,000 to 5,000 neurons, pushing it almost to 10,000. So this, this D is actually the empirical neural space. It's what people call the ambient uh, dimension. And it's actually a subsampling of the total number of neurons that participate in the task. 
So let's go back to our plot of the population activity. So here again is about, about 20 seconds of recordings and each row corresponds to a given neuron of the order of 80 neurons. And during these eight, uh, 20 seconds of recording, the monkey has made reaches to three different targets. So the targets are eight. They are these targets surrounding the central, the central target, as we discussed earlier, and they are color coded. So you may reach to the yellow target, the red target, the blue target. And essentially we take a single data point per trial. We measure neural activity for a period of about 250 to 300, three, actually 300 milliseconds in this case. We measure the number of spikes emitted by a given neuron on during that particular uh, time being, and that is the measurement associated with that particular trial. So in principle, this, this uh, column that allows us to measure the number of spikes emitted by each one of the neurons during that particular beam is a vector in this 80 dimensional space, can be represented as a point in an 80 dimensional space, which is the empirical neural space corresponding to the ambient dimension. We cannot visualize an 80 dimensional space. So just to give you an intuition of what this looks like, I'm going to choose three particular axes corresponding to neuron 46, neuron 70, and neuron 78. Neuron 46 is a neuron that fires a lot, Neuron 70 is a neuron that fires very little, and neuron 78 is a neuron that has kind of an average firing rate. And so I'm going to show you all the points corresponding to all the trials in this three-dimensional space, spanned by axes that correspond to the activity of neuron 46, neuron 70, and neuron 78. And after I have put all the points in that three-dimensional empirical space, I will color them according to the target, according to the target that corresponds to the specific trial. So again, here how we have our, our surrounding targets color coded, and we have this three dimensional space corresponding to the rate at which each one of these three neurons are um, emitting spikes for that particular trial. And as you see, when you put all these points in the three dimensional space, and then you color coding according to the trial, to the target that was being uh, reached in that particular trial, there isn't any particular structure, there isn't anything of interest that, that captures our eye. But this should not disappoint you completely. It just simply should tell you that this idea of going to three dimensions by selecting three neurons at random is not a good idea. And if you did a more sensible type of dimensionality reduction, you might be able to see some structure. And that was actually the, the case um, in, a, in a task seen many, many years ago, and I'll, I'll guide you through that. So what is it that we are doing? So we have in a, a very large neural space and we are putting an electrode array that allows us to measure just the activity of a few neurons. So capital D, which is the ambient dimension, is simply the number of recorded neurons. And we see the spikes emitted by neuron one, neuron two, and neuron three because of the electrodes that have been implanted in each one of those particular neurons. But what happens as we now execute the trial, execute the reach and cut back, and we are just recording from these three neurons so that each time being gives us a point in this three dimensional neural state space. What we see is actually the trajectory described by this population activity as the trial proceeds is not exploring the full empirical neural space. It's not uh, exploring the full, all the ambient dimensions, but it is actually confined to a low dimensional structure that is embedded in this higher dimensional empirical neural space. This is a beautiful observation made already by Cunningham and Yu in, uh, in 2014, where they discussed the importance of looking at population activity. And uh, going back to, to this uh, idea, then is we are subsampling, we already see the activity of neuron one, neuron two, neuron three. These are the spikes emitted by each one of these neurons. This is uh, a simplified version of the raster plot that I showed you earlier. And now when we go to the empirical neural space spanned by the axis corresponding to these recorded neurons, what we see is that the activity is confined, almost confined to a low dimensional manifold. And a very important question that arises immediately is whether this low dimensional manifold is flat, that is to say linear, or curved, that is to say nonlinear. So in the case where it is flat, and this is, you know, the, the black is the actual trajectory and the gray is its projection on, on a, the corresponding hyperplane, that is to say the, the activity is not 
completely and precisely and fully confined to the low dimensional manifold, but mostly it is, although it can fluctuate out of the manifold at times. In the case when the manifold is flat, then it's very easy to describe it. We just find a basis. In this case, these two vectors, u1 and u2, they are unit vectors orthogonal to each other, and they provide a basis that spans this particular hyperplane. In the case of a nonlinear manifold, then the description becomes a little bit more complicated because we can locally create a basis, but this basis actually changes the orientation of these vectors, change as, changes as we move along the trajectory. But let's stay initially in this very simple case of, of U1 and U2 being the basis vectors. U1 and U2 and all these, these um, vectors that span the low dimensional manifold to which the activity is confined are actually directions in the neural space and therefore each one of them corresponds to a specific pattern of co-activation of the neurons and therefore each one of them is what we call a neural mode a particular pattern of exciting the system that we're recording from so that what matters is not the level of activity of each neuron but their coordinated level of activity which can be made excited by a certain amount. So once we project into that space, this is what we learn and that's very interesting. This is the failure that I had shown you before when I tried to create a three-dimensional um, space to represent the data by just selecting three neurons at random. And this is the much improved uh, description that we get if we find neural modes and we project into a three-dimensional space spanned by neural mode one, neural mode two, neural mode three, where now the data, not only it clusters, it clusters, the clusters correspond to specific targets, but if you look at the distribution of the targets in real space going from orange to, um, from orange to, I don't know, the mixture of orange and yellow to yellow, that's exactly the organization of these clusters in the neural space. So there is a code in the neural space that represents actually the physical distribution of the targets and represents the ex a physical space in which the target is supposed to be, um, in, to be executed. And this um, it, is uh, one of the early results that showed us the utility and the, the usefulness of, of neural modes. And it comes to the lab of Krishna Shenoin, which was published in 2009. I want to give you a slightly different perspective of this. So here I'm showing you that the neural modes provide us with a very, very good tool for describing the collective activity, for describing the joint activity of the neural population. And I want to show you a complementary mode, a, a complementary view, which is the idea that these neural modes are actually the building blocks of the neural activity. That when we look at the neural activity, we should not concentrate on what individual neurons are doing but that the way to best describe the population activity is to look at the degree of activation of the neural modes. That is to say the neural modes can be thought of as a generative model for the activity of the individual neurons. So let me show you what I mean by that. So again, we are focusing in population dynamics and I want to think of the level of activation of these neural modes, which I would call the latent activity or the latent variables as a generative model for the level of activation or degree of activation of the individual neurons. So once more, we have, we are recording from these three neurons, neuron one, neuron two, neuron three. We see that the activity can be confined by a plane that is spanned by two neural modes, U1 and U2, as I showed you earlier. And then as a function of time, now I'm here, I'm, I'm smoothing the curve to think of time as continuous. I'm thinking of the level, I'm monitoring and tracking the level of activation of neural mode one and the level of activation of neural modes two. These levels of activation of the individual neural modes are the latent variables. And I want to uh, show you that a linear combination of the latent variables allows me to recreate the spiking activity of the individual neurons and the coefficients of those, that linear combination are the coordinates of the two neural modes in the original neural space. So the first column corresponds to neural mode one, and this is the contribution of neuron one, neuron two, neuron three to neural mode one, and the second column is the same for neural mode two. So this particular mixing of the latent variables allows us to recreate the activity of the individual neurons. 
So this leads us to this completely new notion in the way of considering uh, the activity of, of populations of neurons, which is that the latent variables, the activation of the neural modes, are the building blocks, and that individual neurons are nothing but projections of the latent activity onto individual axes. But the, the individual neurons are in some sense following the conductor, and the conductor is the latent variables. The conductor is the degree of activation in the neural modes, and this cannot be in any other way, simply because these neurons are part of a network, the neurons are interconnected, they have patterns of covariance that are captured by the neural modes that cannot be ignored. So I cannot activate individual neurons, and therefore the activity of individual neurons are not the right vocabulary for describing the level of activation of the whole population, or the degree of activation of the whole population. So we have this idea of neural modes spanning a neural manifold. The, in the linear case, it's very simple. The neural modes are just the bases, U1 and U2, that describe, that, that span the um, hyperplane to which the neural activity, the population neural activity is confined, but we have to allow for the possibility that the neural manifold is nonlinear. So we have to distinguish two different dimensions here. One of them is the intrinsic dimension, which is the dimension of this potential nonlinear manifold. This is a very simple example in which the intrinsic dimension is one. And then if you alter this perfect circle, the intrinsic dimension is still one. And if your data is confined to the surface of this sphere, the intrinsic dimension is two. However, if we want to see these nonlinear manifolds in a, in a linear space, we need an embedding. In this part top case, the minimal embedding is two, so that's what we call the embedding dimension. But as soon as we deform the circle and the circle is not lying flat on a plane anymore, then the embedding dimension is going to be larger than two, three, or more. And here, if we want to embed the two-dimensional manifold, which is the surface of the sphere, we need at least three dimensions. So there is a distinction between the intrinsic dimension, which is the dimension of the nonlinear neural manifold in which the dynamic, the, the dynamics, the trajectory that describes the dynamic evolution of the data lives, and the flat dimension, which is the minimum number of dimensions that I need in a, in a flat space that will contain the nonlinear manifold. And this is an important distinction to make that is sometimes lost when people talk about and, and describe to you results about the flat dimension. They should always remember that there is a possibility of an intrinsic dimension that is smaller than the flat dimension. There is always a possibility of a nonlinear manifold of lower dimension that is embedded in this linear manifold that we are tracking within our linear dimensionality reduction skills. And this will apply, of course, to the data that we'll show you today, because since I told you earlier, I'm going to be interested in the unreasonable effective of effectiveness of linear methods. I am going to be employing linear techniques for dimensionality reduction. Therefore, I will be telling you about flat dimensions. But we should always keep in mind that the possibility that even within this flat, uh, this flat manifolds, there is still more structure, which is a nonlinear manifold of lower dimension embedded in this flat manifold. So, um, oops, sorry, I showed you that. So, the idea of neural manifolds, linear and nonlinear, is has been you know, relatively successful and has caught a lot of attention in looking at population dynamics. And my colleagues and me published a, a neuron paper in 2017 where we talk about latent variables about this time-dependent activation of neural modes, and we talk about neural modes then and their activation as the, as the building blocks of neural activity, it, which is the generator of, of cortical activity. Um, we work mostly on, on the neural, uh, in the neural generation of movement, um, in the neural control of movement, and therefore we concentrate in a particular area of the brain, which is primary motor cortex. But I wanted to show you the ubiquity of these neural manifolds. The, these neural manifolds and neural modes have been observed in many other brain areas, frontal cortex, prefrontal cortex, parietal, visual, auditory, and olfactory. So we gave in our 2017 um, 
mini review in neuron references to all these other cortices and all the other activities within which this population activity was observed and observed to be confined to a low dimensional manifold. Um, this was, if I update it uh, now, you will see many more recent papers where people try to um, establish what is the origin, what causes these low dimensional manifolds to emerge in the dynamic of brain areas. And again, sustains the idea or gives more uh, evidence for the idea that this is a flexible activation of neural modes that is the general mechanism for generating brain dynamics. And of course, we believe that this is what underlies neural computation is the dynamics of these neural populations. So um, let me actually go to what we all want to hear about, which is what we do about this problem. And again, go back to the unreasonable effectiveness of linear methods. So this is the, the task that we started out with, this center outreaches to one of eight peripheral targets. We have monkeys in the lab that have been doing this task for a couple of years or a year or months. And because it's, it's always the same task, the behavior becomes very stereotyped. So here I'm showing data for one particular monkey in which we go from day one to day 400 to day 700 and something. This plot shows the trajectories to all eight targets, always color coded. And as you see, the trajectories are very stable. The cursor on the screen traces an XY, a trajectory on the XY plane to go from the central target to the peripheral target, which is the target in that particular trial. And in doing so, it executes um, a trajectory that has an X and Y components of velocity. So if we go focus on one particular target, this one, the, the target going sort of northeast, then you can see that the, the, y, the X velocity and the Y velocity components of the cursor in going from the center target to that particular final target are also very, very stereotyped and very preserved across all these different days. So to quantify this, this stability of the behavior, we computed the correlations between the X and Y components of velocity along these, these 800 days for which we have data for this particular monkey. And as you see, the correlations are very, very close to one. This is a, a histogram of the correlations of the hand velocity. So as you see, during this very, very long period of months and years, the behavior is very stereotyped. So we, our hypothesis was that there has to be a very stereotyped neural dynamics that is generating this behavior. And could we actually extract these neural dynamics or across time and show that it was stable? So we ask about neural variability. So when we ask about neural variability, we saw actually, I don't want to, to dwell much on this particular slide, just to show you that the movement is very stereotyped. So here again, we have the X and Y velocities, Y in a lighter purple, X in a darker purple for each one of the eight trials. Here I'm comparing day 27 to day 43. We are recording 80 neurons in one case, 84 neurons in the other case. And you can see the trajectories are very, very stereotyped, but you can easily see that the neural activity is not stereotyped at all. You can see here, a very active neuron that is not in this plot. You can see here a cluster of very active neurons that don't appear in day 84. Here you have another very active neuron on day, eight, on day 43, sorry, that doesn't appear on day 27. So the problem with this kind of electrode array is that the electrode array moves a little bit, goes down, it begins to, begins to record to have access to other neurons or a little bit of, of scar tissue can form around the electrode, so you can lose some neurons, so you lose some neurons, you gain some neurons. The neurons that you're recording on day M are not the same neurons as you're recording on day N. So this posed a very particular problem because how can we capture stable neural dynamics underlying a consistent behavior when we don't have access, consistent access to a particular neural population? So on the monkey is executing the task on day one, he's executing the task on day N. The, the behavior is very consistent. However, on day one, we're recording from a set of neurons. On day N, we're recording from another set of neurons that will have some overlap with the recorded on day one, but not much. And how can then we um, extract 
and latent dynamics that is consistent and stable when we cannot record from the same neurons. So what our goal here was to create an alignment of the latent dynamics. And this is a very important schematic slide of what we are trying to do. So let me walk you through it. This is the full neural space. So this is the neural space if we were able to record all neurons in this true full neural space, there would be a true neural manifold and there would be a true latent dynamics. So this is kind of a mother manifold that is embedded in a neural space in which the axis corresponds to each one and all of the neurons that are being modulated by this specific task. On day one, we are recording a subset of those neurons, which are neuron one, neuron two, neuron three. So we are looking at a projection of this space in the space attended by the neurons recorded on day one. That is to say, this the empirical neural space, the ambient space of day one. On the other hand, on day n, we are recording from a different of neurons. We are recording from neuron four, neuron five, neuron six. So we have a different ambient space. We have a different empirical space. We have an embedding space in day one and a different embedding space in day n. Both of them, both these spaces are projections of the full neural space that is spanned by all the neurons that are modulated by the task. Now we'll go back to the embedding space in day one, to the ambient space in day one, and, and look there at the empirical neural manifold that captures most of the dynamics and the latent dynamics captured by it. So because we're going to do a linear dimensionality um, reduction, this is again a projection. It's a projection of from the axis that span the embedding space onto the neural modes that span the flat manifold. So we have an empirical neural manifold on day one and the latent dynamics on day one, and we can do the same on day n. And now what we want to do is to create a space which is the union of the two embedding spaces so it's, an, it's a space whose cardinality is equal to the union of the number of neurons recording in day one and recorded in day n. In this space, we will have a hyperplane spanned by the neural modes of day one, a hyperplane spanned by the neural modes of day n. Each one of them has its latent dynamics and we want to do is align the dynamics in these two spaces to see if we can make them to coincide or not. So it's an alignment of the latent dynamics. That's the goal here. So as I said before, what is the problem that we are facing is that we have a substantial turnover in neural recordings across days. Therefore, the empirical neural space in which the experimental accessible neural manifold and therefore the latent dynamics that we observe are embedded are going to change across days. We have an hypothesis, which is that the true latent dynamics associated with consistent behavior should be stable across days. But in order to verify this hypothesis, we need to compensate for the fact that the true latent dynamics is being projected onto different empirical manifolds on different days. If our hypothesis is correct, we should be able to compensate for this change in embedding space by using a linear method, which is canonical correlation analysis. And why do we think it's enough to, um, to use a linear method? is because the two dimensionality reductions that have occurred here are both projections and therefore both of them linear. First, we go from the full neural space to an ambient empirical space spanned only by the neurons that we're recording from. And the second is a linear dimensionality reduction to find the neural modes and therefore the neural manifold to which the latent dynamics is confined. Both of them are projections, therefore both of them are linear operations and this is why we hoped, we started by exploring a linear method for alignment, which is canonical correlation, canonical correlation analysis. Okay, so in any a given day, day, both day N or day M, we have a data matrix. This data matrix has a structure that we discussed before. The number of rows is equal to the number of neurons that we are recording from. We are recording from capital D neurons. That is the dimensionality of the empirical neural space. And we are recording over capital T time beans, and that is the number of columns in this matrix. So every column is a point in the d-dimensional empirical neural space. So we have a matrix like this for day n and a matrix like this for day m, and we are going to perform a singular value decomposition in each one of these data matrices. 
Both data metrics are, as, as we just uh, argued, of dimension d by t. The ambient dimension d is going to be the cardinality of the union set of neurons recording of the n and the n. So we put all the neurons together. And if at a given day we, a neuron has not been recorded, uh, then we just put zeros on that. It's just missing data. The neuron was not recorded. And capital T, again, is the duration of the experiment. So we assume that we are recording from all neurons every time we perform the experiment, uh, the, both the neurons of the N and the M, and the ones that have not been recorded just get zeros in the corresponding data matrix. So we have a data matrix for the N, a data matrix for the M, and we do a singular value decomposition for each one of these. These matrices U, UN, and UM are D by D matrices and give us a basis that, that span the corresponding neural space, the corresponding empirical neural space in day N and day M. So what we do is we take these matrices UN and UM that are capital D by capital D, and we keep only the first D columns of these matrices, the leading D eigenvectors of the singular value decomposition, and we obtain what we call UN tilde and UM tilde. And then what we do is we project the we will be able to project the data into the subspaces span by the columns of UN and UM. Before we do that, what we could do is construct the D by D inner product matrix of these two D by D, by D matrix, D by lowercase D by capital uh, D matrices. And what we do then is get a, a diagonal matrix that defines the order cosines of the principal angles between the two hyperplanes. So one hyperplane is spanned by the d-dimensional, the leading uh, d columns of the matrix UM, and the other hyperplane is spanned by the d leading eigenvectors, the lead columns of the matrix UM, where lowercase d is the flat dimension. That is the dimension of the hyperplane that we decide to keep. That is our linear dimensionality reduction. So just to, to be a little bit more, more graphical about this, Let's say that we are recording from three neurons. We have neuron one, neuron two, neuron three. This is the hyperplane that spans the activity of the M. And then we have vectors U, N, U1, and U2 for, for the N that span this particular uh, flat dimension. And then on the M, we have this, this green hyperplane that spans by vectors V1 and V2. And in this case, V1 was equal to U1. So there is one angle that is a zero angle, and U2 is not equal to V2, so there is an angle that is non-zero that gives us information about the relative orientation of these manifolds. So we could do that, but that's not really what we are interested in. What we are interested in is in the dynamics in each one of these manifolds. So we take our matrix, data matrices Xn and Xm for day N and day M, and we projected them onto the corresponding d-dimensional manifolds that have spanned by the neural modes. And how do we do that? Well, we use these matrices UN tilde and UM tilde that have exactly lowercase d columns, that is to say the leading columns of that span the d-dimensional subspace on the N and on the M. So we take the data matrix on the N and we get a latent, a matrix of latent variables LN and we do the same on the M and we get a latent data matrix on the M. So these data matrices are now of dimensionality lowercase d by t. Lower, lowercase d is the flat manifold dimensionality. It's the dimensionality of the latent space. Capital T is the duration of the experiment. And these latent variables, if you, if you think of them, each one of the columns corresponds to one of the, uh, each one of the rows corresponds to one of the dimensions, each one of the columns corresponds to matrix T. So if you look at, at a given row, every one of the rows is a dynamic evolution going from T equals one to T equals to capital T, and each one of the different rows correspond to one of the different dimensions that spans the corresponding manifold. So we could at this point compute the correlations between the uh, these latent variables, which are analyzed, analyzed, and this would be just the pairwise cor correlations between these rows, the rows of LN and LM as a function of time. So we could construct it and see that indeed these are not aligned at all. 
And this is where canonical correlation analysis gives us a wonderful tool. Canonical correlation analysis starts with the QR decomposition, not as the matrices L, but of their transposes. So now think of the dynamics as vertical. So each column now corresponds to a representation of the dynamics projected along each one of the, of the eigenvectors that is spanning the corresponding manifold. Q is going to give us an orthonormal basics, basis for these dynamics, and R are the mixing coefficients. So once we get the Q matrices, what we do is instead of doing this projection between LN and LM, we do a projection between the Q matrices. Now, here we have QN transpose QM because remember that QN transpose corresponds to LN and QM transpose. Here we have QN transpose and QM because remember that QN transpose corresponds to LN and QM transpose corresponds to LM. And again, we do a singular value decomposition and now the elements of the diagonal matrix S are the canonical correlations, sort of from larger to smaller, and they quantify the similarity in the aligned dynamics. And the matrices U and V are the matrices that give us the new basis that allow us to project the latent dynamics onto the coordinates that give us the maximum alignment. So U corresponds to day N and V corresponds to day M. So this is what we end up uh, getting from this analysis is we get new manifold directions that maximize the pairwise correlation between latent dynamics across the two days. And these are linear transformations. So we have a matrix M, which is U mixed by um, Rn inverse and a matrix M that is V mixed by Rm uh, inverse, each one of them corresponding to different days. And the new latent dynamics are obtained by applying these linear transformations to the previous uh, latent dynamics. Now, these transformations are linear, but they are not a rotation. Remember that the matrices are give us a mixing of orthogonal components. So although the components of U are orthogonal, the components of the matrix M that, that actually affects the, non -li the linear transformation are not. And also there is a scaling having to do with the values of the, um, of the rows of the matrix M, of the matrix R, sorry. So how does this work? Now I want to show you, I want to finalize showing you how surprisingly well this works and, and show you our results. So here we have the data of day one, project on the three dimensional space spanned by the three leading neural modes. I'm showing you one trajectory per target. This is the average trajectory, average over all trials corresponding to that particular target. This is on day one. So the trajectories are separated as you can see. And this is on day 32. The trajectories are still separated, but they're very different from day one. Now we align the dynamics, create, we affect a linear, we affect a linear transformation of this space and a linear transformation on this space so as to maximally align the dynamics. And now you see how beautiful this is. Not only the dynamics are very well aligned, but they also are very revealing because now for each rich trajectory, we have kind of a petal that shows that the, the dynamics of going out to the target and coming back into the central target in each one of the, each one of the reaches. Again, one plot per reach because we have average over all trials corresponding to a given reach. So now we can look at the correlation between how much correlation did we achieve by doing this alignment. So the gray curve that shows very good correlation is the alignment between a morning session and an afternoon session on the same day. So clearly we don't have to do any alignment. Those, those are naturally aligned. We are recording from the same neurons. We are observing the same neural dynamics. Now, if you don't align and allow the days before between sessions to go on, then you see a clear deterioration of the alignment. But then when we use this very simple canonical correlation analysis to align the data, we recover within error bars the degree of alignment that we saw when we compare sessions within the same day, so with, without having to align. So this is a very effective dynamical uh, method that recovers the uh, alignment method that recovers the degree of correlation of the dynamics that exists naturally in this neural ensemble. I'm showing you here data for four different monkeys. This is the data that I just showed you always with the, the gray as the within day kind of um, null or, or uh, baseline. The 
orange as the unaligned and the red as the degree of alignment that is recovered through canonical correlation analysis. This is the data I showed you before for a given monkey over 45 days. This is a monkey over 70 days. This is over 500 days. And this is over 700 days. This is over two years of data. And you see how much and how surprisingly uh, easy it is to realign this data by simply using canonical correlation analysis. This has a very important implication if you are going to use the recorded data as input for um, what we call a, um, a brain machine interface. Imagine that I wanted to actually predict the trajectory in the XY plane from the neural activity so that instead of the trajectory in the XY plane being guided by the actual movement of the arm that is manipulating this, this uh, exoskeleton is actually being, being controlled by the neural activity. So I record the neural activity, I use a very simple linear decoder and I use that to predict the X and Y components of the movement or the X and Y components of the velocity so I can guide the cursor in the screen of the computer without having to actually move the arm just based on the neural activity. So we can do that very well only if we use the aligned activity. If we train a decoder on day one, and then of course on day one this decodes very well, but uh, if we actually use the same decoder trained on day one with activity measured on later days, then the decoder doesn't perform. But if before, given the neural activity to the decoder, we align the neural activity using canonical correlation analysis so that there is another box here, the neural activity is first aligned on day n to day one, then I can use the same decoder, the same weights WI as I use on day one to trace the trajectories, and then I can recover the correct trajectories. So here we are showing you the X and Y components of velocity. Again, within day is very good. If we use across a decoder across days, the R square for the prediction of X velocity or Y velocity is very bad. But if we pre-align the data, those are the blue bars here, then we get a very good um, R squared between the actual X and Y velocity guided by neural activity and the target X and Y velocity that is actually as affected by the arm or the one that we would like the uh, cursor to, to describe or the screen if we were not going to use the, um, the actual movement of the arm, but we were going to use a brain machine interface. So all this is based on this very simple idea that we put forward in the paper published earlier this year, which is that the basic idea is there is a, a mother neural space spanned by all the neurons that are modulated by the task. In that neural space, there is a mother manifold that could be linear or non-linear, most likely non-linear. And we can project that full neural space on any given day on the neurons that are being recorded on that day to create an embedding space, to create an empirical neural manifold uh, with an ambient dimension capital D. And we can do that on day one, we can do that on day N. And then in each one of these, of these empirical neural spaces, we can find a subspace, a, well, not a subspace, but so a hyperplane that is subtended by neural, the corresponding neural modes that captures most of the neural dynamics described by the population as the task is executed on that day. We can do that on different days, and then we can use canonical correlation analysis to create a stable, to recover a stability and to, to, to try to capture the stability of the representation in the mother space and the mother manifold, which we don't have direct access to. So what is the future of this? Here I have shown you data for a very simple stereotypical task, which is a central task that the monkey comes, you know, often to back to the lab and, and execute this task. This is why the behavior is so stereotyped. The future of this is to monitor natural behavior. So to have a monkey in a cage with different objects and he decides what to touch, what to grab, whether to climb or not to climb. And we can record um, an ensemble of neurons via these electrode arrays that, that are being transmitted in a wireless form to a computer. 
and we can monitor as, as a proxy for the actual movement. We cannot monitor X and Y velocity, but we can monitor the activity of a variety of arm muscles that are being recorded by, by subcutaneous uh, implants. And so the idea is that a decoder that allows us to predict the muscle activity based on the neural activity would also benefit from the kind of pre-alignment that we can achieve, the pre-alignment of the data that we can achieve by um, using canonical correlation analysis because there is, for each one of the tasks that are natural tasks that have been repeated many times, there is indeed a stable manifold corresponding to that task that we are able to unveil in this manner. Uh, and the other, of course, open frontier is to extend all these to an accurate and reliable treatment of the nonlinear manifolds that we can all agree on and get the same results on. And that's the end of my talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah, for the fascinating talk. Really enjoyed it. We already have one question from Jonathan Rubin. So, uh, and this is a question that I wanted to ask also as well. So it's, um, um, yeah, I'll read it now. Uh, when you form your data matrices, XN and XM, over the union of O capital D neurons recorded on days N and M, how do you know what capital D is? In other words, since your array has the same number of contacts on day N and M, how if there has been a change in which neurons were recorded right. between days? Is this based on spike sorting, for example? It's very good question, Jonathan. Thank you. Yes, it's based on spike sorting. So when you do this analysis, it's very important to, to track the identity of the neurons. And so therefore, an electrode could capture, you know, this electrode could capture the neuron or could capture a combination of two or three neurons. So the signal <laughs> that comes out of an electrode is not necessarily representing a given neuron. So we have the usual methods for spike sorting based on the statistics of the interspike intervals, based on the actual shape of the action potential. So we do that to monitor the identity of specific neurons. So we can say these are the neurons recording on day N, these are the neurons recording on day M, and these are the neurons recording on both days. So what we do is that union, recording on both days, recording on day M but not N, and recording on day N by not M. And that's the dimensionality of the matrix in that case. All right. Um, thanks. Uh, I, I have another question related to, um, to it's more clarification. Um, is it um, your, your neural modes, are they like principal components? Is this what they are or you're using something else to? Uh, we have, that's and again, a very good question. The data that I showed you from the Chenoy lab, which is, was the first evidence of the existence of these uh, linear um, manifolds, was actually factors analysis. Uh, it doesn't make a big difference whether you use principal components or probabilistic principal component of factors analysis. Factors analysis tends to do a little bit better because in, in if, you know, if, if you believe in a Poisson assumption for the statistics of individual neurons, the variance depends on the, on the, on the typical firing rate, on the average firing rate of the neurons. So different neurons have different variances. So, um, a noise model that allows for different variances in the different directions, it's a little bit more accurate. But from the point of view of extracting the manifold and the subsequent results, it doesn't really matter. You just get a better degree of variance accounted for, for a given cutoff that you choose for how many eigenvalues, how many eigenvalues you're going to keep, that's all. Thanks. Uh, so there is another question by Marina. Are thoughts created by the same or different set of neurons at different periods of time? Are they the same, created by the same set or different sets of neurons at different periods of time? Are the manifolds I, the same? Uh, well, you know, if, let's say that the set of neurons were totally different. So this manifold is living in the space of, of the neurons that are recording on day N, and this manifold is living in the space of the neurons recording on day M. So if they are totally different neurons, I cannot compare the manifolds because they are living in different spaces. The, this is the reason for creating the union of these spaces. If the, if the neurons were totally disjoint, that is to say, if no neurons were recorded on both days, the dimensionality of the joint space will be just the sum of the two dimensionalities. There will be no, no shared neurons. 
but in any case, you have to create a larger space in which the two hyperplanes live before you can compare them. Because otherwise, you know, if they live in totally different spaces, you cannot compare them. Now, once you do that construction and then you have the manifolds, then you can compare the manifolds by looking at the angle between them and the, the canonical, the principal angles between them. And then what you find is that there are some angles that are very, very small. That is to say, there are some directions in which these manifolds have more or less the same orientation. And as you include more and more uh, directions, that is to say, less and less relevant eigen, eigenvectors with less and less dominant eigenvalues, then these angles increase monotonically. But they are always much smaller, we find, that it would have been if we have picked uh, two hyperplanes at random in that space and, and computed the angles, the, the principal angles between them. So it's, it's a very, very significant uh, uh, deviation. I don't have the slides here to show you, but uh, we have shown that in, in some of our papers. And it's, uh, these, these manifolds are not the same, but they are extremely aligned in orientation compared to two random manifolds. Oh, okay, thanks. Uh, in that sense, I wanted also to, to clarify your alignment, if I understand correctly, your aligning for, let's say, the, the reduce the ambient space, you're aligning it to something which maximizes the correlation with all the rest of the days? Is that what, and no, that's why? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah we are ali we are, the alignment is always between two days. Is pairwise oh, okay. in two days. And so what we are trying to do is the trajectory on this day to be as correlated as possible to the trajectories on the other day. Find the axis so that when I projected the trajectory on those axes, the trajectories look as correlated as possible. Yeah. So it's maximizing that correlation. But it's always a pairwise comparison. And in the case where you're interested, for instance, in, in, the, in the decoder for brain machine interface, you want to refer everything to day one because you want to train the decoder on day one. So I want to align any subsequent day yes. with day one. But in principle, I could pick two arbitrary dates, day N and day M, and do the pairwise, pairwise comparison between those two days. Uh, yes, so, so for the long periods of times, so you will just go day by day? So when I show you when I show you data separated by thirty days, we took all the pairs of, of data that were separated by thirty right. days. Uh, so non, yeah. but when I show you the data for the decoder, then it was always referred to day one. Yes, thanks. So actually, Jane Wang wants to ask a question, but I don't think I can unmute the participants. Um, uh, I don't unmute it, yeah. Oh, there it is. Oh, okay, sorry. Great. <laughs> sorry. Sarah, ni ni nice talk and uh, nice to see you online. Nice to see you, Jane. Uh, I have a more general question. Uh, in these tasks, you know, there's a long sequence of events from a vision all the way to the muscle. So that you are trying to find this uh, nice reduction how to go from the uh, neural activities all the way to the muscle, which is wonderful. So. Um, I, this, I, I, I'm not familiar with these uh, specific neurons. When you talk about these M neurons, where are they roughly in this pathway? So M M1 neurons you're, is primary motor cortex are very, very close to the output. These uh -huh. neurons are actually two synapses away from the muscles. They project to neurons in the spinal cord that project onto the muscles. Yes. So the, the coordinated activity that you see in M1 has to result in a coordinated activity of motor neurons in the spinal cord that uh -huh. results in the coordinated in a coordinated pattern of muscle activation that allows you to execute a reach in one direction versus a different direction. So we're really in this very interesting sensory motor pathway that, that you described, yeah. we are very close to the output. You're very close. So these are the motor neurons and uh, 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 and also you're saying roughly about three gives you a good representation. Is that, you think, a fairly generic feature for- No, this is a task that I'm showing you. Yeah. The task is very, very simplified. You uh, can present this task in a plane in some sense, right? So yeah. the, the, there is a very, very beautiful paper by the group of Surya Ganguly at Stanford that, that discusses the expected dimensionality of these manifolds in the context of, of, uh, of the, an intrinsic dimensionality of the task. That has to do with, you know, how many degrees of freedom do I need to describe the task itself? Yeah. And I need to be able to control at least as many degrees of freedom 
in the in the muscles um exactly. in the family of 200 muscles or 100 muscles that are participating in the task in order to actually understand how many control signals do I need at the neural level. So this is why when in, in this slide where I show the future natural behavior, I don't expect these, these manifolds to be so low dimensional. The question is how much more high dimensional do they need to be? I, can I see a progression from doing the central task to, I don't know, to brushing my teeth to playing a piano sonata? Can I see eventually an increased dimensionality in the manifold that controls that specific task that, that captures the increased complexity of the task. Right, okay, very good, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, well, I think we are over the time anyway and there are no more questions. Uh, thank you very much, Sarah, again. It was really, really interesting. Talk thank you, thank great. you very much. Um, thank you for hosting the session. It was a pleasure thank you. to be here. Thank you all. So I will uh, actually gonna close the session now. Thanks again and have a good day, the rest of your day. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye everyone.